celebrating 41 seasons on the air. Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, the USDA eases its rules on catfish inspections. Efforts to restore an economic safety net for cotton producers remain alive in Washington. Festivals and agritourism bring people and money into rural Mississippi. We'll preview the upcoming Fall Flower and Garden Fest and show you the impact of the Mississippi Pecan Festival. On the Food Factor, Natasha shares the easy way to peel a hard-boiled egg. While Gary shows you how silver and burgundy colors are a perfect combo in any landscape on Southern Garden. Farm Week starts right now. Layton Span. And I'm Amy Myers. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. Well, Hurricane Irma gave Mississippi some rainfall this week, but thankfully not much else. Meanwhile, in Texas, farmers are still working to recover from Hurricane Harvey, and you'll see their struggle in a moment. But first, a major rule change from the USDA for catfish processors in Mississippi and elsewhere when it comes to inspections significant in that Mississippi is the largest producer of farm-raised catfish. Effective this month, the government now considers the catfish process more like meat processing only operations rather than like slaughter operations. Now for the industry, this means inspections by USDA inspectors will only be made in plants on a once per shift basis rather than on a continuous basis as was the case. The rule change will apply to overseas catfish processors as well if they use the same workflow as American plants. The one inspection per shift requirement will make it easier for foreign producers to achieve USDA equivalents. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, some economic relief for cotton producers is another step closer to reality. The House Agricultural Appropriations Subcommittee is including funding for cottonseed as an oilseed program in its fiscal year 2018 budget proposal. The Senate Appropriations Committee had already included similar safety net coverage in their proposal. The National Cotton Council is applauding the progress. Our focus continues to be on short-term economic relief. We were, we were considering the, the cottonseed amendment the, the cottonseed as a PLC crop as a bridge program to the next farm bill. Uh, and that, that was our intention to build baseline and to build uh, economic support for cotton producers until we got to the 18 farm bill. If enacted, the cottonseed policy would apply beginning with the 2018 cotton crop. Although Hurricane Harvey is long gone, cattle producers in Texas are still dealing with flooded pastures and soggy ground. The area southwest of Houston seems to be the center of the cattle catastrophe. Paul Yeager reports. Cattle ranchers spent much of the week rounding up herds displaced by Harvey. 1.2 million beef cattle are in the 58 counties declared state disaster areas following the storm. Southwest of Houston in Wharton County, Texas, the land where 60,000 cattle usually graze was filled with water. The animals found safe locations for survival. I know my son's been out there in the water for two days, uh, at least waist deep, uh, working, trying to either move cows to higher ground or get hay to them and see that they're okay. We're on a larger area. We're dealing with ground that, that doesn't support equipment, doesn't support horses. So we're gonna try to get this hay out there. I've got about three different ideas of, of okay, if this doesn't work, we're gonna do this. And if this doesn't work, we're gonna do this. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. There's no quick and easy solution for flood damage, but there is one for a common roadblock often arising in the kitchen. Hard-boiled eggs are the perfect food for a quick, nutritious snack. Eggs are also the perfect complement when chopped up and added to a salad. But peeling these protein-packed eggs can be difficult if they're not cooked correctly. In this week's 
episode of The Food Factor, MSU Extension's Natasha Haynes shows us how to cook the perfect hard-boiled egg. Jojo, what are you doing? I'm feeling an egg. You know there's an easy way to do that. What? Yes, I can show you how to take the shell right off. Struggling to remove sticky, crumbling shells from hard boiled eggs can try anyone's patience until you learn this easy solution. To boil extra large eggs, place it in the bottom of a saucepan or a large pot and fill with cold water. Make sure they are fully submerged with at least an inch of water above the eggs. Turn on the heat and bring water to a boil. Now remove from heat and cover with a lid. Set a timer for 15 minutes and let the eggs sit. When the time is up, carefully remove eggs and place them into a bowl of ice water to cool for two minutes. The eggs should then be much easier to peel the shell off. So why does it look so green? That's simple, Jojo. You just overcooked it. <laughs> well, wait, 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 wait. Next time, just use a timer. Thank you. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Natasha says make a dozen hard-boiled eggs at once for a great snack on the go throughout the week. For some folks, weekends were made for gardening. And maybe you've been out looking for a great looking color combination for your landscape. In this week's edition of Southern Gardening, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman says he's found a winning combo. He tells us now about several plants featuring the colors burgundy and silver. I really like silver and burgundy. It's just something about when they're planted together, they make for a winning landscape. Let's take a look at a couple of great ground cover choices in these colors. A great alternanthera selection is Purple Prince with its compact mounded habit. When grown in masses, it creates a tight and full ground cover. I think the foliage is beautiful with burgundy purple tops and on the underside a reddish ruby rose. Purple Heart is a trailing perennial in Mississippi with purple stems, violet purple leaves, and little pink flowers. It likes the full sun, it will grow in almost any soil, and is very drought tolerant. Often called Dusty Miller, Artemisia has soft fuzzy gray foliage that makes the leaves look dusty silver. I've recently found a new and I think very useful variety called Quicksilver that grows about 10 inches tall with a 24 inch spread. The silvery color of the foliage seems to intensify and enhance the colors of other garden plants. Lamb's ear has a very descriptive name. The foliage color is a cool, silvery, muted sea foam. The leaves have a fuzzy texture that have a very soft feel. In the spring, flower spikes shoot straight upward with small purple flowers. So if you like burgundy and silver like I do, Try planting some of these plants together. They're sure to make a late summer statement in your landscape. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Gary says that these plants not only look great, but they all thrive in our hot and dry Mississippi summers. Well, Amy, before we get into the markets, we've got to mention this record length alligator harvested off the Mississippi River recently and you're going to tell us about it. The Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks says the male gator measured 14 feet 3 quarter inches long and is the longest male alligator ever taken by a permitted hunter in the state. Now this gator was caught in Natchez by Brian Burnside of Brandon and if you're guessing about the weight 766 and a half pounds. That's a lot of alligator. Well, moving into the markets now, merger of two heavyweights is nearing completion. Also ahead, optimism in the cattle market that it will turn higher. A big harvest continues to pressure corn prices, while hurricane impact on cotton prices is likely to be limited. 
A major ag industry merger is now final. The new company, it's named Dow DuPont. It began trading on the New York Stock Exchange earlier this month. Concerns remain about whether the merger is creating decreased competition. Meanwhile, two other proposed mergers are still said to be in process. Kim China's purchase of Syngenta and Bayer's merger with Monsanto. Well, consumer demand for beef due to losses in the hurricanes could help move cattle prices higher. Trader Sue Martin thinks that we could see a trend like this all the way into the turn of the year. Because we've got less cattle coming as we roll the year over. Mm -hmm. And I think demand's excellent. Our exports have been phenomenal. Some say, oh, we're going to fall back now in September. Maybe. But here's the other thing. Nobody thinks about Houston and the surrounding areas oh, and cattle. all the meat that was lost in that area uh, contaminate whatever, the schools, the grocery stores, the homes, okay. restaurants, everything's going to have to be thrown and reordered. Kind of like something we've seen out in, I think it was New Jersey and that After area. Sandy. Uh, yes. You bet. And so I think that's going to set up another demand. Okay. Might take a little bit, but I think it's going to add to the demand. Well, let's pause and play a little chicken trivia now on Farm Week. Our question today, it's about the popular meat chicken. Last year, per capita consumption of chicken in the U.S., was 91 pounds. Let's back up the clock. What was per capita chicken consumption in the U.S. in 1960? Is the answer 16 pounds, 28 pounds, 53 pounds, or D, 69 pounds? We'll have the answer coming up shortly. Tuesday's supply demand report from the government raised U.S. corn yield. And that was not what most of the trade was expecting. As a result, corn prices took a hit. DTN's Darren Newsom says the market simply has no reason to rally. Right now, we're still on schedule for adding to this five years in a row of the largest production numbers that we've ever seen. You know, we're going to be down from last year, maybe even from the year before that, but it's still going to be in the top five. So until we get a piece of news, that, you know, the situation that we've developed for ourselves, the, until we get that piece of news that says production's not going to be as large as what was earlier forecast, market has no reason to rally. It wouldn't have mattered if the, if the tours came in and said, you know, we're going to see a huge reduction from last year. It's still not official notification and markets wouldn't, won't react. China opens up its doors to U.S. rice. Trade officials say the purchase orders from China initially may involve just package products. Delta Farm Press quotes CEO Bob Cummings of USA Rice as saying the industry is hoping to ship at least 50,000 tons at the beginning and then build on those numbers. Well, turning to our market interview, price moves in the cotton market due to hurricane damage are only expected to be subtle. Now, out in Texas, extension specialist John Robinson says he thinks crop losses won't be significant enough to move the market much. Meanwhile, here at MSU, extension's Brian Williams says recent crop reports indicate to him that demand is more important than ever. How did the market miss the acreage number for cotton so much? Well, the planted acreage number actually stayed the same. The harvested acreage was lowered by about 130,000 acres. Um, the, the big uh, change here was the the change in the yields and they bumped up the yields by 76 pounds per acre on cotton nationally um, that's higher than it was for the last several years um, and, and marks one of the highest yields we've ever seen mm -hmm. um, how, how long will the market trade these particular numbers you think uh, well the initially the the markets came down by about uh, three cents per pound um, the day that the report came out. They've since kind of leveled out, so I think that we're going to kind of see a, a holding pattern um, going forward in terms of, of where the markets are, at least until we get something else to move it. Now, obviously, all of this means that demand is more important than ever, super important. Is that correct? It is, and, and that's one big positive that we've seen out of this, this most recent report is the demand numbers are, are still really strong. Um, in fact, the, the uh, demand, the global demand for cotton or global consumption for cotton was up uh, by the largest amount that we've seen in several years. So in other words, exports are looking good at this point. They are. Exports are looking very good right now. 
So, putting this all together, what would you expect the cotton markets to do in the short term, say? Well, in the short term, uh, the big thing here is, yes, we've got strong demand, and that's helping to give a little bit of a bottom to the cotton markets. But on the flip side, we're looking at the, the largest ending stocks that we've had in quite a while, which is going to put some downward pressure on the markets. Uh, so I think we're going to see a little bit of tug of war and, and somewhat of a holding pattern, at least until we start to see some of the harvest numbers. And I think once we see those harvest numbers come in, that's what's going to move the market in either direction. And back to the trivia quiz now as we wrap things up for this week in the markets. 57 years ago, the per capita chicken consumption in the U.S. was only 28 pounds. B is the correct answer. We're going to pause now for a short break, but don't go anywhere. Still ahead, this year's hurricanes are not expected to move the cotton market much. And in the feature segment, festivals and agritourism continue to pack a punch. As far as economic impact, we'll visit two events that bring people and money into rural areas of this state each year after year. Stay with us. utilize private well water as the source of your household drinking water, then you need to get it screened for bacterial contamination at least once a year. Today we're going to show you how to take a water sample for this screening. First, water sample bottles are available from your local Mississippi State University Extension Office. They are sterile, sealed, and contain a small amount of sodium thiosulfate to dechlorinate the sample for a more accurate screening result. Choose the faucet that is closest to the wellhead. If a water hose is attached, remove it before taking the sample and try to avoid any dirty areas. Using a disinfecting wipe or an alcohol type towelette or a paper towel wetted with a light bleach solution, kill any bacteria that may be present on the faucet. Allow the solution to dry before collecting the sample. Turn on the water full force and let it run for at least two minutes. After that time has passed, Reduce the water flow to a small stream. Grab your bottle and unwrap the protective seal. Do not touch the inside of the bottle. Fill the water sample just above the 100 milliliter line, making sure you do not overflow the bottle, which might rinse out the powder in the bottle. Screw the cap back on the bottle and get it to the Mississippi Well Owner Network workshop or the lab as soon as possible and definitely within 24 hours of collecting the sample. Late September and early October are somewhat marking the beginning of festival season in Mississippi. These days, you don't need much of an excuse to celebrate, well, anything. But it's about more than just celebrating. It's about bringing people and money into the community. And many small Mississippi towns are finding success with a new brand of festival mixed with ag tourism. Today, I take you to the Mississippi Pecan Festival in New Augusta and the Fall Flower and Garden Fest in Crystal Springs. Every town has a unique history with stories to tell. Pieces of those stories are often told at community events like fairs or festivals. Mississippi State University Extension Community Development Specialist Rachel Carter says these events help boost local economies by using what a town already has without the need for new infrastructure. Festivals can generate quite a bit of um, new money in a town in a short period of time. Tourism is a contributor to the economy without requiring a lot of infrastructure tourism is celebrating the things that are already there. It contributes to the economy when people come in and spend dollars in local communities, that, that's direct spending, and then you also have indirect and induced effects because those um, that spending uh, spills over into other assets because it helps with employment, and then those dollars can then be spent on infrastructure such as street improvements, uh, police force, uh, and even your local schools. And it also can create a way to market your town during other times of the year because a town can become known for their festival. 
So what makes a good festival? First, Carter says it's important to showcase the town's history, why it was settled in the first place, and celebrate its unique history and qualities. For example, the Mississippi Pecan Festival in New Augusta is located on a living history homestead at an old pecan orchard. Thousands of visitors come each year to experience an authentic step back in time. It's become so popular that some folks even bring campers and vendors come from out of state for the three-day event. The reason that we like to keep on coming back is the repeat customers. We have customers that come each year to buy more brooms. The clientele dictates the different colors and style. We try to have spring colored brooms in the spring, of course, and then as it gets to fall, well, then we'll go with the fall colors. The broom press is an 1898 broom press. The um, uh, winder is in the uh, 1880s. We dye the broom corn to have the different colors. This is a usable piece of art. Along with selling brooms, Thompson offers broom making demonstrations. In addition to the countless numbers of vendor booths, educational demonstrations are on site, including corn husking, horse drawn field plowing, wildlife exhibits with various birds, old fashioned biscuit making, and many others. Folks can stroll through the pecan orchard and shop for a wide range of holiday home decor, unique handmade toys, gourmet food items, various styles of clothing for all ages and interests, handcrafted furniture, beautiful baskets of all sizes and colors, an array of decorations for year-round use, collectible antique pieces, hand-painted works of art, and even beauty products. Visitors can also participate in rock climbing or the bungee slingshot, as well as check out farm animal exhibits, which include turkeys, chickens, goats, and more. And all day long, the festival is serenaded by a variety of live music. To top it off, Fulmer's General Store is on site and open all year long, offering many homestead items as well as deli lunches. With tourism being Mississippi's fourth largest private sector employer, it's become evident that small towns are learning how to boost their own economies. According to the Mississippi Tourism Association, the industry's figures for fiscal year 2015 indicate $6 billion were spent by travelers and tourists in the state. 22 million people visited Mississippi. Tourism and travel account directly for over 85,000 jobs and the industry's direct payroll income for the year totaled $1.84 billion. Another festival that's helping boost its local economy is the Fall Flower and Garden Fest at Mississippi State University's Truck Crops Branch Experiment Station in Crystal Springs. About 5,000 visitors on average attend the annual event, and MSU Extension Vegetable Specialist Dr. Rick Snyder says the fest offers something for everyone. Well, we have walking tours, uh, seminars, in total about 25 different things each day. The plant vendors have tens of thousands of flowers for sale and they sell really well. And then uh, a lot of people who come here also go to other events and other businesses in the area. Like just in Crystal Springs, uh, a couple of the more popular side trips or after trips are Wilson's Meat Market. It's a pretty famous place to go to get fresh meat. And we have another one with yard art. They get really busy right after the fest. People go over there. Visitors and their families can explore, shop, or participate in seminars involving cooking healthy meals, designing floral arrangements, creating floral craft items, plant disease identification and control, maintaining a healthy pond, growing healthy gardens, and much more. Walking tours include a showcase of the trial gardens with the latest flower and vegetable varieties. The trial garden is to determine what varieties of various annual flower uh, crops will do best in Mississippi for our Mississippi producers. And the ones that do the best are the ones that the nurserymen will order seed for and grow for the, uh, for the retail public the following year. The high attendance is credited to excellent marketing. Organizers constantly update social media pages 
post high quality photos, event schedules, list of vendors and contact information, along with accurate directions. And you can always expect a prompt response to questions. The Fest even has its own smartphone app. Rachel Carter offers additional tips for successful festivals or other events. It needs to be in a safe area and be, be walkable and also be accessible to those with disabilities. It's also important that you provide um, clean restroom facilities, places to sit down, shade, so that the longer people will stay at your event longer. Columbus, Mississippi sets a great example for this. Right now, we are standing on a, a wonderful pedestrian bridge. It once was a bridge that was used for transportation, and now it's, it's a tourist attraction where events are held. As small cities and rural towns continue capitalizing on their originality, it becomes clear that a little creativity and resourcefulness reap a harvest of benefits. I'm Amy Myers reporting. Let me get you up to speed on this year's Fall Flower and Garden Fest mentioned in that story. It's coming up fast. The 39th edition of this annual event is just a month away. It will be Friday and Saturday, October 13th and 14th in Crystal Springs. Now admission to the Southeast's largest home horticulture show is absolutely free. So is the parking. Hours are 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. both days. Crystal Springs is about 28 miles south of Jackson. Well, that's going to do it for this week's show, but you'll want to make sure you tune in next week. Harold Darner's love of the land inspired him to help future generations just starting out. He placed his land and house into a trust. That trust now leases the property to young married couples with an interest in farming for five-year periods of time, and the couples only pay for a reduced rent on the farm ground. Also next week, the Food Factor goes on the road to a bakery where the specialty is crackers. And Southern Gardening showcases one city's roundabout where some tough plants provide colorful beauty on Main Street. Thank you so much for joining us this week. I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Amy Myers. We'll see you again next week.